Okay. Basically, what I want to do is go over and do an overview of how Braille works and what it looks like. Um, as classroom teachers, you will not be expected to become competent in producing Braille um, to any great extent, but it's important that you understand um, what, how it works and what it looks like so that you can communicate with students um, who are using Braille. So next slide. Okay, um, just a little bit about the history. Um, as you can tell, a really long time ago, the Braille Code was um, developed in France by a young boy who was blind. His father was a harness maker. And at three years old, he managed to um, poke a tool in his eye and put out one eye and then lost the other eye, which is typical. That happens often um, afterwards. Um, and he went to a school for blind children and decided that he could create some way for, there were a number of different ways that materials for blind kids were produced um, or back in the day. Some of them, one of the ways was um, enlarged regular print letters, which was very tedious to produce, not having the kind of, in the 1800s, not having the kind of technology that we have now, and not that easy to read with your fingers. So he decided that he, um, there was an army guy named Barbier who had developed a night writing set of skills that um, then uh, Louis Braille decided to take that concept and come up with the Braille system. And he did. And then eventually he also created the music code for Braille as well as um, print letters, words. Um, and then later he became a pianist and organist and then went back to the School for the Blind and uh, was a teacher at the School for the Blind. So that's where Braille came from to start with. Um, 18, uh, his life was 1809 through 1852. And he was 13 years old when he started developing the system. And at 15, he finished, um, which is phenomenal that a child would, would create a code that we are still using to this day. So next slide. Okay, um, it's important that you understand um, sort of how a braille letter or character is constructed. And this is a braille cell. It has six dots, um, two rows, two columns of three each, and they're numbered. And the reason that you number the dots is so that you have some kind of language to communicate back and forth um, about which dots we're talking about that should happen. Um, and so you start at the top left and it's one, two, three. The top right, four, five, six, as you go down. Next slide. Okay, so at, on this one, basically the A, B, and C are what is showing. The empty dots are where the empty circles are where a dot could be, but it's not in this particular configuration. So an A is just, just simple dot one, and D is um, dot one and dot two. C is dot one and dot four, they go across, and there's a braille word at the bottom. And I can't see your chat, so somebody still has to tell me um, what um, what they think that says. What does the braille word say? Amanda Cab, thank you very much. <laughs> That's exactly what it says. Next slide. Okay, and here's the Braille alpha guy, alphabet. The, the dark full circles like before are the dots that are actually used. And then you see the shadow dots, little teeny tiny um, dots that show you which, where in the cell, that helps you to see where within the cell something sits. So for instance, if you look at the D, when it sits in the top part of the cell and it's dots one, four, and five, it's the letter D. When it sits in the bottom part of the cell, so it would be dots two, um, five, and six, that becomes a period. So it's important that you have the, when you're learning, that you have the shadow dots so that you can tell where within the cell those dots, actual dots are. But this is what the Braille alphabet looks like. When, um, when it was created, 
Holy Grail did it without um, without a W in it because there are very, very few French words that actually have a W, the use of W. So that was not even originally included in the alphabet. And we had to add it when, um, actually he added that when a student who was from England that was in the school for blind in France um, asked to have the W added. I guess their name must have started with the W or something like that. Next slide. Okay, so the real numbers are just variations of those same six dots. The thing that you see that looks like it's connected to dots, um, a backwards capital L, that's a number sign. Technically, it's called a numeric indicator, um, but commonly it's called a number sign. And then where you see the A, that's one, that's, um, the number one. Um, a B is the number two, C is the number three, and so forth. Um, a J is Row. So when you're going to have a 10, you have to have the number sign and then an A and a J to make number sign one zero from there. Next slide. Okay, so here's a little exercise for you to do. We just talked about numbers, and there's a little cheat sheet box over on the side that shows you what those numbers are. So um, can somebody just read out the math, a math problem? In print numbers, not in Braille. <laughs> the top one looks like four plus three equals seven. Exactly. Exactly right. Okay, so the second one makes me curious because I think it's supposed to be negative two. <laughs> right? Ten minus five. No, oh no, it's twelve. Ten minus five is five. I thought no. it was two. I thought it was zero minus two. On oh, the second one? Yeah, no, I got that one wrong. Okay, notice that there is an A in there, which is the same as as a one. One. Number okay. Five. It's one zero. So you have 10 minus five. Five, okay. Okay, equals five. Yeah, <laughs> okay, equals five, all right. Um, can anybody do the multiplication one? Would that be uh, seven times seven equals 49? Exactly, thank you. Yep, and the last one. Oh, that's cool. 150 divided by 50 equals three. This is fun. Okay, good. Yeah. Uh, basically, you're, you're just decoding. I mean, this is just a decoding process um, once you have the, once you have like your little cheat sheet to go from. And also the, the operation signs, the plus minus equals, um, there is a real symbol for that. Um, I figured at this point you didn't need to get that carried away. Um, but there's a braille symbol that does not, uh, multiplication does not look like an X or a dot. Um, but anyway, this is where you can go from there. All right, next slide. Okay, just to let you know about the part of the thing and understanding about braille and, and um, where it all comes from and who's in charge of making changes, is just to understand what all the braille codes are. The code that we use in the United States now, as of 2016, and all of the other English-speaking countries in the world is called Unified English Braille. It's commonly referred to as QED. Um, 
it is different than the Braille that we used before that. So if you were working with adults, or if you were working with possibly students in high school, they will be used to the old code um, and not necessarily as fluent in the new code. There are enough differences that most people can make that transition without too much trouble. They get hung up on things like um, those crazy symbols on the top row of your computer, um, at signs, um, ampersands, brackets, braces, uh, parentheses. Those are all very different, and so sometimes they get hung up on those. If you're working with kids, they started out, have started out since 2016, learning UED, so they'll be fine with the code. There also is a UED math and science, because you have a lot of different symbols in math and science that you do not have in um, most literary kinds of materials. So that's a code for an advanced version of UED. Um, and the old code that we use for mathematics, which was designed by Abraham Nemeth, um, a lot of a lot of students, a lot of adults, especially if they're scientists or mathematicians, they still use the Nimitz code. It is a great deal more specific and um, includes a lot more stuff than the new math science, the UEB. And so people who use it in careers will continue to use the Nimitz code. And there now is a way to incorporate the Nimitz code into the regular UEB code, and that's a whole other system. So as you hear people talking about different words, at least you'll know what they're talking about. The difference between adults who learned, it's what's called eBay, E-B-A-E, English Braille American Edition, and most of them don't even know the name of those words, but they, they will not know UEB quite as well and will have a few stumbling blocks along the way. Next slide. Okay. Two other things. Um, there's uncontracted Braille, which means letter for letter. And there's a little bit of another decoding task for you. Um, it would used to be called grade one Braille. People got really confused about grade one and grade two Braille. And so BANA, which is the Braille Authority of North America, that is the entity, the agency, that controls what they're in charge of, what the Braille code is and is not. They're the ones that make the decisions about what we call it. Anyway, they decided to change it so that we're using uncontracted, which is letter for letter, and contracted, and I'll show that to you. So again, here's your alphabet. You will cheat sheet on the side. See how good I am giving you a little cheat sheet to work from. Um, and um, can somebody read this out? Okay, Stacy, you and Kat are together, so certainly you can decode this whole thing. Hi. <laughs> okay, I'll help you out with this one. There's no punctuation, number one. And it says, I can do this, C-H-I-S, this. Um, and then if we look at the next slide, we're going to see contracted Braille. Okay, same sentence. There are all kinds of shortcuts because Braille is so, uh, takes up so much room. Braille can only be so small. It's the smallest that most Braille readers in the United States can read um, it is about the same as um, a sans serif um, 26 point type. Um, interestingly enough, in Japan, the standard is 24 point type, so it's a whole lot tinier in Japan than what we have here. But um, so, so Braille can only be so small, you can't just like shrink it down. That takes up tons and tons of room. So having all these contractions that are in the middle of it, it's now called contractor braille, not grade two braille, um, but it's the same thing. 
um, helps a whole lot. So this particular sentence, you'll see it says I, B, D, T, H. This is the same sentence we just looked at, contracted. I can do this. And so anytime you have a C, no space before it and after it, that means the word can. A D, no space before it and after it, means the word do. There's an entire full alphabet of those things. Um, and then the T, this is the T, H symbol. That means the two letters, the H, where they come together. And that also has a whole word contraction. When you see it by itself, with a space before it and after it, or in this particular case, punctuation, which we aren't even going to say, um, this is capital I. There's only one set of letters, by the way. If you're going to make it capital, there's a symbol that goes in front of that. If you're going to make it italic, there's another symbol that goes in front of the same I, so the same I is always there. So this says, I can do this, but there's a capital sign at the beginning. There's an exclamation point at the end. And so there's you know, some choice in there. Been in, interjected there. So um, let's look at the next one. Okay, this is a Slayton stylus, which is the um, least technical form of being able to write Braille. You have a Slayton stylus in your kit. I believe. And so if you have one and you want to try writing um, and you can get it out, I will be glad to explain to you how this is used. If you'll notice on the very front of this, there is um, there are little holes. And you can't tell in this particular slide um, that they have little notches along the edge. If you'll be able to spell that further down. And then in the back piece, which is the highest on the picture, um, there are actually dents. They're a cell, a row, a whole row of real cells. Um, and there are little dents in the flesh. So what you do, go to the next slide. You look at a whole different alphabet chart. Remember I told you about, I showed you the alphabet chart before. And this is the case. Okay, so you're going to write this with the stylus. The dot one is up the top right side, not not the left side. So because you're basically reversing what you're doing, with the stylus, you're pushing down on the, just that little hole, you're pushing down to the dent that's below it, right through the cup, and until it stretches the paper out. And when you flip the paper over, you have a bump on top of the paper, and you have the paper going in the right direction. A really, really bad thing is to say, oh, everything is backwards. Well, it's just on the other side of the cell. So your dot one is the top right, not the top left. A B, dots one and two, is on, on the right side of the braille cell when you're writing on a slightly style. C is the same, but it's the top dot. And the D is not one, four, five, but instead it's one, two, four. So just think about the shape and how the shape of the usually flip. The worst thing you can do to a student who's earlier is say, oh, yeah, this is backwards. Kids get, um, adults are even worse about this. They just think that it's rude to say that their braille is backwards and like they're backwards and they're not smart enough to do this. So don't say their letters are backwards. They're, they could be reversed. They could be on the other side of the cell. How rude do you want to say that? So go to the next slide, please. Okay. So, with your paper, you want the hinge on the left side, on your left side, and the slightly style horizontal. With your paper, um, you open the slightly style up, and you're going to have the holes, the spaces first, I mean, in front of you. That's what you'll see. You put the paper in there and clamp it down. There's little pins inside the slightly style. It's basically punching in the paper. And if you look at the very top edge of the picture, there is a bump, a significant bump, um, on the left top left corner of this picture. And on the top right corner, there's another one. That's from when this paper was clamped in before. But remember, you're going to flip the sheet over when you're done writing. And so those will not even be noticeable. Those two bumps in the corners are not there. So in order to write, you hold, your, you hold the stylus so that it's... Um, the 
head of the stylus is sort of in the palm of your hand. Wrap your fingers around it. Pull it straight up and down. Start on the right edge and start writing ABC. Or you can start writing your name. You can start writing whatever you want to write. Then when you're done and you take the paper out and flip it over, you're going to see your alphabet. And the dots will be all be in the right place from there. Are there any questions about this so far? The one thing that people always ask is, do kids really write this way? Actually, it's not even taught very often in school programs um, anymore, which is sad. It's like a pencil and paper. I mean, what if we took pencil and paper away from all kids and they didn't have anything to write it and they had to only do it on their computer or only do it on, um, yeah, a computer keyboard, that kind of thing. Um, but this is a way of um, being able to write something in the least high-tech way that you can possibly do it. A, a lot of adults use it. People use to take down phone numbers, make grocery lists, do those kinds of things. Um, a kid could certainly do an assignment, a homework assignment or whatever with it. Probably they would not um, in, in real life to any great extent. I, my personal feeling, having taught for 100 years, um, is, that, is that kids need to learn all of the technology available and that they should have, they should be learning to make and style up because of what if you have no power? Once I had students who had moved um, to Colorado to Denver um, with a family, a student who was earlier, and they lived in a rural area of South America before they moved here. And the mother was just absolutely determined that the child could not have a rail wire, they could not have a computer, they could not have anything high tech because you never knew when you weren't going to have any electricity. And so she had to learn everything from bottom line scratch. Um, that's what the mom wanted, and that's what we did. So uh, she did eventually learn to use a braille writer, and, and, um, but not a computer. She still stayed with mechanical. So go to the next slide, please. Okay. This is a braille writer, also called a brailler. Braille with an R on the end of it, a perfect brailler. Um, this is the kind we see in the United States most of the time. It's all mechanical, totally mechanical kind of braille writer. And the brand new ones look exactly like this one, which when I started teaching long before any of you were born, way back in the 60s, the, that's what they looked like. The new ones look exactly like that, except that now they now come in colors, red, blue, green. Um, it's hard to find a gray one anymore. Um, but that's what braille writers look like. Um, and they, they're mechanical. Next slide. These are the highest levels. Um, the, the blue um, one on the left is a, is a um, Juliet Braille embosser. And Hue and Wear is a company that sells that in the United States. Um, and they're actually built in Sweden, but they're sold here. And the one on the right is an index embosser. It's also built in Sweden, interestingly enough. And they're both they're both braille embossers. They just are different shapes and sort of function a little bit differently. And so that's sort of the highest tech. There is one type of braille embosser that, that made for um, lots of huge volumes of braille. Um, braille production houses use them, and they're like big box kinds of things. But they will all still work the same way. Um, oh, and the, the braille writer, by the way, it's going to use that same six dot thing. Each key stands for a, each key that you push is going to push a specific kind of a dot. Um, it has a go backwards thing and a go up a line button, and that's all it has. It's not very, you have to roll, manually roll the paper inside of it. These are connected to a computer, and everything's automated. It sucks the paper in when you tell it to go and uh, stick the paper out when it's done with the page. So, next slide. Okay, one of the quickest ways to make Braille when you have a, a Braille embosser is with Braille translation software. The two most, um, up, uh, up until recently, the two most frequently used programs in the United States are Braille 2000 and that's very Braille Translator. What you see on the right of this screen is a screenshot of the Duxbury page. 
And if you'll notice, it's all braille. I chose to have shadow dots be there. It's easier for me when I first read. Um, and, um, but it doesn't, there's no shadow dots on the braille face when it comes out, obviously. Um, and if you see on the very, very bottom line, there's a yellow strip, and that tells that the that same place, and it tells you exactly what's on that braille line. It's accurate about 80% of the time. There's something that just does not back translate very well. So you have to sort of know what you're doing if <laughs> you're doing any large quantities of braille. But this is what the screen looks like. You then send this file directly to the braille embosser, and um, it, it embosses it, and there you go. You've got what you need. Um, to get information into this file, you actually, the easiest way to do it is by using Word and typing. You type in the print, then you tell it to translate, um, and you have to, of course, pay attention to formatting, uh, and you do that with, you can do that in Word, which is a whole lot easier, and it translates. Now, both Braille 2000 and Dust, Dust Barrier Braille Translator, which people call Dust Barrier BB2, um, are about $600 for the translation program. Braille Blaster is a fairly new program. It's about 95% accurate. They're still working on it. That um, is free. Yay. We all like free. That's really good. Um, and American Frame House for the Blind has it. And I, on, the, um, on the screen, you'll see the um, website for it and the download. There are good tutorials on how to use it and that kind of thing. I want to stop here and make perfectly clear. As a classroom teacher, it is not going to be your job to produce a student's braille, for the most part. There may be short things you want to do, um, and if you have the equipment to do it, the technology to do it, that's great and whatever. But it's not your job to produce braille. It is the job of the teachers of students with visual impairment in your school district. and. I would be totally surprised to find out that there's a school district somewhere that does not either have one on staff or have access to one to a board of cooperative educational services or some other system like that. But a teacher of this one here has been specifically trained to work with your students who are blind and or who are, are who are partially but visually impaired and also braille readers. Uh, and there's some of those too. But they've been trying to do that. They've also been trained in Braille. It is not your job as a regular classroom teacher to have to do production for your students. So I've had people go, oh, my God, I can't believe I have to add that to my list of things that I had to learn. And I just did not want to put you out about that. Um, knowing um, where page numbers go and what page, you know, is there, um, in other words, knowing the numbers, is a real handy thing for your students, um, for you in working with your students. Knowing sort of what the layout of a braille page looks like, so when a kid sort of gets stuck, you can help them out with that. Um, knowing those kinds of things is helpful, but it is not your job to produce tons of braille for your student. I just want to make that specifically clear. Um, so um, let's see what the next slide says. I'm not even sure where I am. In addition to braille in your classroom, you're going to need tactile graphics. And Anne has talked about several ways in which you um, can produce tactile graphics. And here you see a diagram of the brain, and it has all the braille labels to tell you which part of the brain and what, you know, what that all does. And that's a whole other training. And that's what I primarily do, by the way, as opposed to talking about building braille from the bottom up. Um, but that's a whole other thing. And it, again, knowing how to take an image um, and you get it into the form that a student who is a tactile reader can understand is an important thing. But again, it's not your job to produce complex tactile graphics at all. Um, it's fun if you have time, and if you're interested in doing that, that's really for you. But depending on your teacher's visual impairment, do the primary heavy duty listing, as it were. So, okay. Um, I think there's one more slide. Maybe two. No more slides? Oops. <laughs> oh, okay. 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 <laughs> okay. Yeah. So these are just different Braille embossers, and on the left side, you see 
two different kinds of embossers that are that are that you connect to the computer and send the computer file to. And on the right, um, on the top right, the gold one is, is specifically designed to produce both braille and tactile graphics. The one on the bottom is a is, um, that particular one is a kiosk machine, stands for Pixel and Flash. Um, there are a couple of other brands that are out there. One of them is a Swell's Form machine, and it's dark blue. And then there is a um, there is one that's no longer produced, but there are lots of them out there called a tactile image enhancer. And they use a capsule paper that, when you run it through and expose it to light, you print with a carbon ink, and which is specifically a copier. Most um, sensors like these printers don't have carbon ink anymore. They have pigment in them. Um, anyway, you print on a, this special paper, then run it through there, and the light, the intense light is there, plus it up. Um, and there are real fonts to use with that sort of kind of paper and everything. Um, so, um, again, that's a whole other separate long drawn out training. We don't want to do that, but I just want you to know that there are pieces of equipment that are, there are quite a number of ways to both to do both braille and tactile graphics from there. Um, the the switching that's on the top left, for instance, is, um, um, is a two plus printer, and it actually um, only prints on the narrow, the eight and a half by 11 paper, but it does a really nice job. They also have one that prints um, ink um, on to something, and so you have both print and braille at the same time when you um, when you embossed. Next slide. Okay, so Anne talked a little bit about collage. So there's collage and there's tooling. There are tools that are made. Um, how many of you may recognize the tracing wheel for sewing? It's a little wheel with notches all the way around it. Um, that's what involves the tooling. And then there's the swell paper that I mentioned with the, the Piaf machine and the <clears throat> swell form machine. And there, the, the machine itself is called Fuser, the Fuser. Um, and then you have embossed graphics. And then you have 3D printed objects. So there are a number of different ways to produce tactile graphics. Not, um, I guess I should be putting cricket on my list, um, although I use one from time to time. I need to take a class from Ann, and I've been making um, tax graphics for pretty close to 50 years. Um, so I need to learn a new trick here along the way. Next slide. Okay. Your resources. Your local school district, um, as I mentioned earlier, We'll have a program for students who are blind or visually impaired, or we'll have a contractual agreement with a nearby or in a small district, and maybe don't have any blind kids in the district, and all of a sudden one moves into their district, um, they will have a contractual agreement for somebody that's close by. So we still have a trained teacher of blind visually impaired kids who will serve as a support to you, to answer whatever questions you have, make suggestions for how you can make them feel easy in the classroom, um, how you can support your students. Um, they are trying to do that. And then the, also within your state, there are 48 or nine of them in the country. Most states have a state instructional material center. That's something we call the state resource center. It's part of the Department of Education. And their job is to provide braille materials like braille books. Um, braille writers, all kinds of different equipment for the students, and they provide those through the teachers of visual impaired. But um, almost every state has one of those, and so that's where you'll get the majority of your educational materials in braille um, and in a large print for a student who's not a braille reader, but um, it's using large print instead. Um, also, there may be a local lighthouse for the blind. San Francisco has Houston, Houston has a big one, Chicago has a big one, New York has one. Their cities, Miami has one. Um, and they, uh, the Lighthouse for the Blind primarily is for adults, but they may also be providing um, schools direct um, services direct to schools from there. Um, and then there may be a vocational rehabilitation center for the blind that could also give you some help and um, um, and support you. Now, Ann has um, that spoke earlier, Ann Cunningham. She works with um, a Colorado, our Colorado Center for the Blind, which is primarily a source for adults, but also has a number of children's programs as well. And they're a wonderful resource. 
um, for anything that you need. There may be one of those in your local community as well. So um, I think that may be the end of it. There is one more slide. That's the last oh. one. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. So if you want to learn more about about learning to read Braille by sight, um, Handley um, is one place where they have courses for you to do just exactly that. Um, there is a um, National Braille Press has a website called LouisBrailleOnlineResource.org, and they also have a course for learning um, for learning Braille by sight. There's a Nebraska Center for the Blind has made a YouTube video, which I found by just accident, sort of fun, on how to use a plate and stylus, which I've never seen that one before, so that was sort of fun. Yeah. So um, that's um, so those are some of the resources that you'll have. Um, I also am very happy to answer questions to help you identify um, a resource that's closer to you than um, I am, maybe. Um, and my um, email address is Lucia, L U C I A, at tactilegraphics.org. You can also find out some basic information about tactile graphics on that website um, as well. But if you don't hesitate to email me if you have questions or need some other resources, need some help, I'm always available for that. I'm happy to help you out. So what questions do you have? Are there any questions that we need to be about? Thank you so much, Lucia. Um, I think it's really her point about it's, it, it takes a while to learn uh, to hand braille because um, it is a really a, a good mind. I don't know. It's a good Spatial. mind exercise. <laughs> exercise. And actually the kids that we've worked with um, really take to it um, very willingly and, and, and excitedly for sure. Yeah. Yeah. It's for kids. It's like a secret code. You yeah. Know? You just decode stuff and it's a secret code. And they tend to love to do it. Um, there used to be some great sites, most of which are not there, have to do with funding of agencies and stuff, that were designed for kids in mind, sighted kids, to learn Braille. And they'd have fun doing that with their classmates who were Braille. Um, and actually, I know a couple of professionals that, that has a child in their school that was, that was visual, a classmate that was visually impaired or blind. And that's how they learned to write Braille to exchange secret notes. And that's how they ended up, you know, being professionals that work with blind people because they started out when they were really little. So, um, yeah, it's sort of a fun thing. And thank you for bringing that up, Leslie. I, uh, when the art exhibit was at Boulder last three years ago, I guess it was, um, it was interesting to see how much Braille there was. It was also interesting to see how much accurate Braille it was um, because it's not it's not an easy thing to, to learn um, but it was, I was really pleased to see how much accurate Braille there was that was there. Okay how does Braille accommodate special characters in other languages? Actually each country um, has their own Braille, character, Braille code so if for instance you're doing one of the if you're doing Russian or um, any of the I still really got think of the right word um, any of the uh, languages that have letters that are not like um, our letters in English, um, there are symbols for those, special symbols, just like we, I tell you that um, 145 is what we use for a D. Um, whatever that symbol of Arabic, for instance, um, has its own braille code. Um, so that's um, it's just different in every country. Okay. Oh, and Stacey requested the evaluation form. All right. Yeah, I just wanted to and... remind people um, that we're reaching the end of our day and that if you want to fill out our evaluation, that'd be great. Um, it has a space in there. If you need extra supports to run BDD programming at your at your school, um, you know, tell us what those are and we can uh, maybe address them tomorrow or in a future webinar. So yeah, Lisa said, thank you. Grateful to learn from everybody and looking forward to day two. I think we all are. Um, I think tomorrow will be really a fun uh, kind of 
share out of a lot of different ways that different educators have brought Build a Better Book to their site. So I think you'll hear how mm -hmm. a number of different groups have kind of taken all of these elements and really run with them in different ways to see the kinds of um, different types of project, projects that their students have worked on and different ways that they've partnered with others in their community. Thank you so, so much, much Lucia, yeah. for signing on, especially from your vacation. We so appreciate you yeah. taking the time. Especially since yeah, you're it's just so happy to be at the beach anyway. So. Perfect. <laughs> that worked well, out. Glad okay. to give you something to do on a cloudy day. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thanks. That's great. Well, thank you Bye. everyone for coming. And thank you so much, Lucia, for um, closing us out today. <laughs>